Bruce, a colonel in the United States Air Force, finally met his biological mother when he was in his mid-40s. Then he discovered something unbelievable about her past. Once he stepped out of the train in Shizuoka, Japan, Bruce didn't need any soothsayer to tell him that the petite old woman running towards him was his biological mom. He just felt an immediate connection with her, even before the old woman reached him and pulled him in for a tight embrace. Nobue just couldn't help but burst into tears at once. She had waited for over four decades for this particular moment. Bruce tried his best to console his biological mom, speaking in English, while Shinjo, the interpreter standing beside him, interpreted in Japanese. Bruce and Nobuye just stood there enmeshed in a tight hug for what seemed like ages. It was such an emotional scene to say the least, and Bruce made his best effort to hold back his own tears as he consoled his mother, who he was meeting for the very first time. At long last, Nobue released Bruce from the tight embrace and wiped her tears away with the back of her palm. She greeted Shinjo in Japanese, like she was just noticing him for the first time. Then she tightly held Bruce's right hand and led the way amidst the maze of people while Shinjo followed closely behind them. Nobue flagged down a taxi that took the trio to her modest home, and over the succeeding hours, Bruce would discover something unbelievable about his biological mother's past. Bruce grew up with his adoptive parents, Edward and Eleanor Hollywood in the United States. He had always known that he was adopted right from his childhood days. And to start with, Bruce was well aware of the fact that his Asian features didn't come from his adoptive parents. Edward was of Irish descent, while Eleanor was of Norwegian ancestry. According to Bruce, they always told him, We picked you out special, so you're even more special than everyone else. The couple had adopted Bruce in the early 1960s, while they were both stationed in Japan with the American forces. Eleanor had vowed to Bruce's biological mom, that they would take very good care of her baby boy shortly after she gave him up for adoption, a vow that the couple surely did keep as they treated Bruce like their very own biological son. The couple loved and cherished Bruce even more than some biological parents love their kids. Edward and Eleanor basically spoiled Bruce silly with love and care and made sure that he never lacked anything while growing up. The couple never had kids of their own, so Bruce was their only beloved son, with whom they were well pleased. Bruce, on his part, repaid his adoptive parents' love by being the ideal, well-behaved son. He also did quite well in school, and his adoptive parents were very proud of his excellent grades. As Bruce grew, he developed a really strong bond with his adoptive parents. He was well aware that they weren't his biological parents, but they were all and everything he had his providers, protectors, guardians, his parents, in short. Hence, Bruce really loved and adored his adoptive parents. Bruce had always dreamt of joining the country's Air Force right from his childhood days. He developed an obsession with planes while he was still in his infancy. As a toddler, Bruce loved nothing more than flying toy planes around the home, and he just couldn't stop dreaming of piloting a real one someday. And Bruce's adoptive parents realized his dreams on time. It was quite obvious to them that Bruce was destined for the Air Force, and they did their very best to encourage him to pursue his dreams to the greatest limit. When Bruce was still a kid, his adoptive parents provided him with all the toy planes he could ever wish for, so much so that Bruce's room back then looked like a little toy plane store. After he graduated from high school aged 19, Bruce, with the support of his adoptive parents, enlisted in the country's Air Force. On enlistment, Bruce proceeded to the U.S. Air Force Academy in El Paso County, Colorado, where he would undergo a four-year training course to qualify as a cadet. Bruce was quite overjoyed once he arrived at the Air Force Academy. He simply felt that he was on the right track to achieving his childhood dreams of becoming an Air Force pilot. Above all, Bruce wished to make a name for himself in the Air Force and always be remembered for his heroic deeds in the service and defense of his beloved adoptive country. Needless to say, the four-year training course at the academy was not for the faint-hearted. It was the most grueling, vigorous, and intensive physical and mental military training that anyone could imagine. 
A lot of young, healthy, and dedicated chaps that entered the academy at the same time that Bruce did broke under the intense pressure and difficulty of the training and quit along the way. Many others were sent packing by the no-nonsense and unsmiling training instructors for the slightest hint of cowardice or for breaking the strict codes of conduct in the academy, but not Bruce. He hadn't come this far to miss the chance of achieving his lifelong dreams. How would he even look his parents and friends in the eyes and tell them that he failed the training if he was sent home? Bruce often worried. That would surely be the most humiliating and shameful episode of his life. In fact, Bruce wasn't even sure that he would ever forgive himself for such a humiliation. So he totally dedicated himself to scaling through the rigorous training phase. More than a year into the training program, Bruce got his hands on the real thing. He piloted a real military aircraft for the first time in his life, though with an instructor seated beside him. It was such a surreal experience for the young aspiring Bruce, one that he would never forget in his lifetime. Bruce totally enjoyed the feeling of absolute freedom and achievement that piloting the aircraft gave him that memorable afternoon. Bruce got better at flying planes with each passing day, and he went on to pilot many military aircraft during his time at the academy. After four years at the Colorado Air Force Academy, Bruce graduated with flying colors. He was then duly commissioned as a second lieutenant into the U.S. Air Force in a commissioning ceremony, attended by high-ranking Air Force officers. Edward and Eleanor were present at the commissioning ceremony, and they both watched with immense pride as the Air Force badge was pinned on Bruce's chest. The couple also beamed with smiles as their beloved adopted son took the Air Force's oath and pledge of honor. Bruce's adoptive parents hugged and congratulated him after the ceremony as they took pictures with him in his crisp, full Air Force uniform. It was such a memorable moment of fulfillment and profound joy for the small, happy family. Bruce got married to his high school sweetheart Megan barely three years after he was commissioned an officer. The couple would go on to have three lovely kids. Bruce was a dedicated and excellent Air Force officer. He flew many sorties for the U.S. Air Force and rapidly rose through the ranks. By his early 40s, he was already a full Air Force colonel. What's more, Bruce was stationed and worked at the Pentagon itself, the very heart and symbol of the massive U.S. military might. The adopted Japanese boy was surely living the American dream. Despite encouragement from his adoptive parents, particularly Eleanor, to meet his biological mother, Bruce had never felt the need to do so. He simply felt loved enough by his adoptive parents and was comfortable with his life. Bruce never felt that anything was missing in his life, but all that changed after a dreadful experience that he had in his mid-40s. Bruce had arrived at the Pentagon one early morning and was just stepping out of his car when he had a heart attack and collapsed on the tiled pavement. Some of Bruce's colleagues rushed to his aid, and he was immediately put on a stretcher and rushed to the hospital. As he lay on the stretcher, Bruce thought that this was the end. His entire life seemed to flash by before him. Bruce realized that he had only one regret in life. He never made the effort to meet his biological mother and ask her why she gave him away. Bruce also wished to tell her how well he was doing in life so she wouldn't have to worry. He then made a vow right there that if he survived the attack, he would go on a search for his biological mother. Luckily for Bruce, he survived the attack, and when he had fully recovered, he made good on his vow and began a search for his biological mother in earnest. Bruce first contacted the U.S. Embassy in Japan and sent them the little information he knew about his biological mother but they were unable to help him find her. Bruce then hired a private investigator to help him find his biological mom. However, the private investigator came up with nothing after almost a month of working on the case. Bruce was just about to give up on his search for his biological mother when he had a chance meeting with Admiral Harris. Bruce was at the Dulles International Airport on his way to Germany for a military conference. While he was waiting for his flight at the airport's wine bar, Bruce sat next to Harris. The two men got talking and discovered that they had a lot in common. Harris's biological mother was also Japanese, just like Bruce's. Bruce told Harris about his fruitless search for his biological mom. 
Harris offered to help Bruce. Bruce appreciated the offer, but didn't peg his hope on it. You know what, you're an admiral and all, but you can't. I've been to the embassy. I've tried this, and you just can't help any, Bruce told Harris. He thanked the admiral, though, for his concern. The two men then shook hands, exchanged contacts, and went their separate ways. But just ten days later, Harris made good on his promise in a most remarkable manner. Bruce was in his office one afternoon when his phone rang, and to his utter bewilderment, it was a staff of the U.S. Embassy in Japan calling. Colonel Hollywood, we're really pleased to tell you that we found your mother, Nobuya Uchi, the caller gladly informed Bruce. Bruce was stunned beyond belief, but he recovered in time to start pleading with the caller to help him write a letter to his mom. There's not going to be a letter. She's going to call you at this phone number in 10 minutes, and she doesn't speak English. Good luck, the caller told Bruce before the line went dead. As a military man, Bruce had faced countless moments of tension, but he had never felt so tense all his life like he did at that particular moment. Bruce hastily went online to find a translator to conference into the expected call. He found one just in time before his phone rang exactly 10 minutes after he'd spoken with the embassy staff. And it was his biological mom, Nobuye, on the other end of the line, sobbing profusely. Bruce, who felt so emotional himself, had his first ever conversation with his biological mom through the interpreter. Bruce was astonished when the interpreter told him that the following day was actually Nobuye's 65th birthday and that she had always prayed that her birthday gift would be Bruce coming back to her. That wasn't all. The interpreter also told Bruce that his mom never remarried because she said that in her heart there was only room for one man, and that man was Bruce, whom she had always known would come back to her someday. Speaking with his biological mom for the first time in his life was such a profound moment for Bruce that he immediately arranged a meeting with her. Barely a week later, Bruce was on a flight to Tokyo, Japan with his interpreter Shinjo to meet Nobuye. On arrival in Tokyo, the duo took a train to Shizuoka, and that was how Bruce met Nobuye at the train station, waiting to give him the tightest and most emotional embrace he'd ever received in his entire lifetime. At her home, Nobuye prepared a local delicacy for Bruce and Shinjo, which the duo gulped down with delish. Nobuye then took both men to see her small restaurant, and to Bruce's utter astonishment, the restaurant was named Bruce. It was unbelievable, but it happened that Eleanor had met with Nobuye after they adopted her baby boy and told her the name they planned to give him. Years later, Nobuye opened a small restaurant and named it Bruce in honor of her beloved son. After dinner that night, Nobuye decided to tell Bruce her story. As the trio were gathered around a local oil lamp, Bruce held his mother's frail right hand and gently caressed it while she told him her story via Shinjo. According to Nobuye, she had met and fallen in love with Bruce's biological father, an American soldier named Rob. Nobuye was just 19 then. Nobuye was hired as a cook for the American forces stationed in Japan, and that was where she met the handsome Rob. He wooed her and she fell for him. Rob even promised to take her with him back to the US where they would get married, and the naive Nobuye believed him. Then Rob got Nobuye pregnant, only to deny responsibility for the pregnancy after she told him about it. Nobuye was heartbroken and completely shattered. She really did love Rob. But Rob completely jilted her and cut off all forms of contact with her. Worse still, barely three months later, Nobuye heard that Rob had been shipped back to the US. She never laid eyes on him again. As if that wasn't enough trauma already for Nobuye, she soon increasingly started getting sick after she got pregnant. And as a result of that, she lost her job as a cook in the US military base. It was Nobuye's poor father. Oichi, who was a local fisherman who took care of her after she had lost her job. Then Nobuye gave birth to Bruce and felt that he would have a better life in the US than in the then still poor Japan, which was still reeling from the devastating effects of the Second World War. And that was why she made the painful yet brave decision to give him up for adoption to the Hollywood couple. Bruce was close to tears at the end of Nobuye's touching story. 
It really hurt him to learn everything that she had to suffer just to have him and then give him a better chance at life. Bruce pulled Nobuye into a hug, kissed her forehead, and profusely thanked her for all that she did for him. He then told Nobuye about his own life in the US. Bruce revealed to his mom that he was a colonel in the US Air Force, that his life was awesome, and that he was married to the wonderful Megan with three beautiful kids. Nobuye was overwhelmed with happiness for her beloved son's achievements. All her efforts to give Bruce a happy life weren't in vain then. Bruce spent three memorable and fun-filled days with Nobuye, who treated him and Shinjo like royalty. She never got tired of preparing several local delicacies for the duo and talking with her son. Nobuye even took Bruce to meet some of his relatives, who were all glad to see him. On the fourth day, Bruce and Shinjo returned to the US. Nobuye saw them off to the train station, where she held on to Bruce like she didn't want to lose him for the second time while sobbing silently. It took Bruce's promises to bring Nobuye over to the US soon enough to meet his family before she finally let go of him. Mother and son then bid each other farewell, and as Bruce and Shinjo boarded the train, Nobuye stood there and waved at her beloved son, while wiping her tears until the train disappeared out of sight. Barely six months later, Bruce made good on his promise and brought Nobuye over to the US. She had such a good time in the US with Bruce's lovely family during the Christmas holiday. Megan treated Nobuye with so much respect and warmth. The two women basically bonded like they'd known each other for ages. As for Bruce's three little kids, they were all over Nobuye, like a rash from day one, and she never got tired of playing with them. Over the next couple of years, Bruce remained quite close to Nobuye. He frequently returned to Japan to spend some time with her. Sadly, Nobuye passed away from natural causes just three years after she reunited with her beloved son. Bruce was by Nobuye's bedside when she breathed her last. Nobuye's last words to Bruce was that she would always love him, and that she was fulfilled that he finally came back to her just like she had always prayed for. Bruce is now retired from the Pentagon and lives with his family in Vienna, Virginia. Bruce says that he feels blessed and fulfilled, and that not a day goes by that he doesn't think of Nobuye and all the sacrifices she made to give him a better chance at life. What do you think about Nobuye's sacrifices for Bruce? Feel free to share your comments with us in the comment section. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.